Well, good evening, everybody here and uh, out in the state. It's a pleasure to be here. Obviously, these are exciting times in the cattle business and all of agriculture for that matter. We in the cattle industry have record cattle prices. We have record corn prices. We also have record uncertainty and we have record volatility. So uh, with all of that, of course, there's a lot to say. And the bottom line that we're going to talk about tonight is with the high prices of everything, can we background cattle? And, um, and I think the answer, to, we'll kind of save that answer to the end, but I think the, the answer is very positive there. So um, a couple housekeeping details. You see my website there, if I can get the arrow to go here. Uh, I do have a cattle situation and outlook on my website that I update every Monday morning. I just pulled a few slides out of this one to uh, show you this evening. I have probably 40 slides on my cattle outlook on the web, and I have maybe 20 or 15 here. And so, again, we update them every Monday morning, and if you want to see these same charts a week, a month, or a year from now, uh, help yourself to that. So, uh, again, hi to all of you. If you can see this, I'm kind of standing in the way for the, the uh, people here, so I'll get out of the way. But, um, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about a lot tonight and several slides in the right, the next slides uh, talk about weather. But anyway, this slide was taken in western North Dakota in August. And of course, the unusual thing about this slide is I like the high. That's why I took it, but you see green. And usually, obviously, it is not green out there. And the grass usually isn't that tall either. So uh, that's part of the weather that, uh, that we're going to talk about. In fact, kind of the opposite weather. Uh, and normally, you see there at the top, I talk a lot of, 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 about a number of different price and production patterns. Tonight, however, we're just going to concentrate on seasonal price and production simply because we're only talking about backgrounding. You see the cycle, I'm not even going to talk about the cattle cycle. If I was giving a tire cattle outlook or more a cow-calf or a longer term, like you see number three there, we talk about the cycle the long term. Then we have all these unexpected influences, and of course, with these record prices, everyone is asking, when is another one of these things going to come along to cause a disaster and prices to go down? And I obviously can't answer that, and the last decade was really a tough one on us because we see all of those things. And uh, in the middle of the screen there, I don't know if I can get my arrow to come up so everybody can see it, but now we have drought in the southern part of the U.S., and I'm going to talk about that, that is going to cause uh, a, a, a lot of uh, interest in backgrounding and uh, probably will make backgrounding up here uh, a very good alternative. But again, uh, many, many things can affect prices, and I'm only going to talk about the seasonal patterns, as you see there. Okay. The most important driver of feeder cattle prices and our backgrounding potential is going to come from two places. That is corn prices and weather. Like I said, here's a picture of weather in Texas compared to our previous green slide there in western North Dakota. And you see they are in the most devastating drought that they've had on record in places down there. So actually recent developments in both corn prices and weather uh, have positively impacted backgrounding potential even over a month ago. If I'd have been giving this talk a month ago, I think from a backgrounding standpoint, it would have been a lot grimmer than it is now. But also keep in mind that both of these are volatile. And when we get into the next few slides here and show you some corn prices and some weather and so on, that you're going to see that. So just because things have changed to where they are now from last month doesn't mean that they're, they're not going to change again. So please keep that in mind. Here is the U.S. drought monitor. It's as of Tuesday of the week, but it comes out every Thursday morning. So tomorrow they're going to reassess, but the, we won't get the new map until Thursday. And the darker the color on this screen, the more severe the drought. You see over on the key on the left-hand side there, that very darkest is exceptional drought in all of Texas is in uh, exceptional or either D3 or D4, a lot of D4 up into Oklahoma and so on. So very, very dry down there. And this is important for a lot of aspects, particularly from a backgrounding standpoint, because this is the time of the year when usually a lot of calves go on winter wheat, particularly down in Oklahoma and Kansas. 
and uh, this year because of the drought conditions the wheat is not up and we will we won't have winter wheat for calves and so they won't be in the market Oklahoma alone has about two million calves then they import another million calves some as far away from here to put on winter wheat my counterpart down there says they will not import a calf for winter wheat grazing and in fact they are getting rid of calves and have already moved into the feedlot Again, uh, things can change here, and you see even drought for the first time this year, or the, just the abnormally dry, creeped into southeastern North Dakota there, and, uh, but look down into southern Minnesota, Iowa, and so on. So that was a concern for us. Is this drought going to expand and get bigger, and particularly for next year, and how will that affect the entire cattle business? But well, again, things can change in a hurry, and just yesterday and over the weekend, we had rain all the way just go down from about Jamestown or go down from central North Dakota, start up in the Canadian border, and my cursor just doesn't work very well. But go all down to the tip of Texas. Again, the baseball game down at, in Arlington right by Dallas yesterday was postponed because rain. they hadn't had rain for a year, and then it rained out the game. And so down through this central part of the U.S., there was significant rain, but I just talked to my counterpart down there, and that really isn't enough to solve the drought problems. It might get some winter wheat going and so on, but he says still there will not be any winter wheat grazing of calves. If they do get in or any winter wheat, which looks less and less possible, and the later you get, the less you can put cattle on there, that it would go to keep some more cows around and to put a few cows on there. So again, this weather can change as it has, and, and, um, and we've already had more rain uh, yesterday and today in Fargo than we had all of September. So. Again, it, it rained a little bit here. Uh, this next slide on the top is more what I talk about when I'm talking about the cycle in the long term, but most of you were aware of this, that we are decreasing the cow herd, and um, on July 1st, we had 4.5% less heifer calves in the U.S., so that means our cow herd will downsize again next year. And again, uh, looking at the northern plains, we're in a different scenario. We're expanding herds up here. In fact, beef replacement heifers are up 12% in North Dakota, but in Texas, Oklahoma, and so on, it's so dry, and uh, they have a lot more cattle than we do. Uh, Texas has 5 million cows. Oklahoma has another 2 million cows to compare to North Dakota's less than a million cows. So they're going to trump any herd rebuilding that takes place in the U.S. But the more important one for us tonight when we're talking about backgrounding is from a feeder cattle supply standpoint. These are the cattle outside of feedlots being fed to slaughter weight that were available on July 1st. We're down 2.5%, so that means we have fewer to go into feedlots or to do with whatever, make replacement heifers out of them or so on. And so from a supply side, we're going to be very, very tight, and that is supportive for all feeder cattle prices. Uh, and, however, I know you, many of you are looking at these cattle on feed reports, and our cattle on feed reports continue to show more cattle on feed and more placements, yet we have on the previous slide fewer cattle to put on feed. So what's going on here, and how does that fit into the backgrounding scenario? And so, again, maybe too many charts on here, but the top chart shows that, yes, our feedlot, net feedlot placements have for the last several months, June, July, and August, uh, well, June and July were above last year and above the average. Uh, the August cattle placements were 99% of a year ago, so just down slightly from a year ago, but even more than the average. And you go down to the heavier weights on the uh, bottom left-hand side of the screen there. Uh, again, uh, heavyweight placements are down along with the cattle outside feedlots, and this is what we would expect with the fewer amount that we have available. But when you go over to the bottom right-hand side, you see where all the cattle and feed coming from. It's from these less than 700 pounds. In fact, really, it was from less than 600 pounders, way above last year, way above average. So this is the Texas-Oklahoma calves that would normally go on winter wheat and then come out and be sold about the same time when we sell our backgrounded calves, are already in feedlots, being fed to slaughter weight, and so uh, a couple of things here. One is, since those calves are already moved, 
that's going to put a floor on how low calf prices go this fall because a lot of them have already been sold. But on the other hand, when we're looking ahead to January, February, selling our backgrounded cattle up here, we're not going to have as much price pressure from all those Oklahoma City calves coming to market because they're already in the feedlot. So that would be supportive to backgrounded cattle prices in January, February, and so on. So again, like I said, weather is really affecting us there. Uh, I uh, do not predict corn prices and don't do much with them. My counterpart, Frank Olson, is right in the next office to me, and so I let him have all that fun. But anyway, corn prices are record high, and uh, so when we're talking about background and calves, when feed costs or corn prices, if we're going to use corn are record high, that is a concern to us. But again, I've got a couple more charts to show you, and... Uh, and uh, although corn is record high, we see here in the last month since September 1st, corn prices from a cattle backgrounding standpoint or a cattle feeding standpoint has now went in the right direction and the futures market lost $2 in a month and this is the cash Omaha prices down $1.50. So again, that's uh, even though we have from a historic standpoint high corn prices, we have uh, record high cattle prices as well, and, and this did go in the right direction. And a little bit more on that when I get into the futures and so on. But one thing we see here, like I said at the beginning, things are volatile, and we expect that volatility to continue. And yeah, they went down $2 on the futures or a buck and a half here in the cash market, but it could easily go the other direction. So volatility is going to be the name of the game, I guarantee you that. So let's just go to some of the seasonal patterns for our calves and, and then... Uh, um, kind of wrap up and, and see if there might be a question. These are 550 to 6 weight steers in North Dakota reported by the USDA market reporters and uh, on the bottom and I'm not going to go through every year I could spend a whole hour just on this chart and kind of would love to do so but we have to move along but I have 2007, 8, 9, 10 and 11 on here and you see uh, 2011 on the top running well above any of those previous years and in fact we will set a, a, a record high this year um, but back to where these come from uh, for the ones on the bottom USDA reported five markets and that is West Fargo, Jamestown, Napoleon, Kists and Mandana, Stockmans and Dickinson but due to budgetary constraints have dropped West Fargo and Jamestown now so from now on out and, 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 and starting this year, it's from the three markets, Napoleon, Kists, and Stockman. So for those of you up in Minot in Williston along the Highway 2 markets, you're going to have to take several dollars off from this. But again, I'm not quite as worried about absolute prices as, as I am worried about the trend here. But keep in mind that your prices up there would be a little bit lower than along I-94. The seasonal pattern, again, for calves is to go up, reach a peak in April, when we don't have a lot of them, when they're just a lot of them are being born, and then there's a good demand for grass cattle, and then decline be the lowest in October, November, when they're all coming to market. And you see this year we're following that seasonal pattern uh, almost exactly, and um, there are about one, I'll show you the market report from last week, but it's right to about 139 right now. I expect a, some more weakness. We have sold very, very few calves in North Dakota yet. By this time, there would usually be more coming to market, but again, the grass is green. We're still harvesting and a lot of associated issues there, and so we haven't sold many. But when the bigger runs hit here in the Northern Plains, uh, I do expect some more weakness and, you know, maybe down to uh, kind of where we ended up uh, last year. But still, we're going to have a floor on prices because all those southern or a lot of those southern calves have, have uh, already went. And then, uh, again, uh, with the shorter supplies and so on, uh, higher prices next year. But from a background standpoint, we're kind of just uh, worried uh, where they are now. And just kind of to put that into sp perspective, back here, of course, that those prices do look very high or look quite a bit higher. But when we go back, our previous record high in feeder cattle prices was 2005, that dashed line in the middle. And so when we, and then the, the aqua line there, the next one down was 2006. And so we're really just back in terms of prices, just a little bit 
before what we were in 2005 was a previous record year. And our cost, all our cost of production has went up since then. So the one thing we don't have record of, at least on the cow-calf side in particular, uh, would be record profits, even though we have record prices. But again, uh, I like to use a previous year as kind of a guide for what prices will do this year. And so this year I've been saying let's use 2005 as a guide, and we have been running at or above that. And so, uh, again, I think those 2005 uh, fall prices would be uh, kind of a good one for us to look at. The other thing that I'm going to mention is, however, now we have a much wider range in prices than we had back in 2005. And when I get to the market report, I'll allude to that a little more. And Carl's going to... Carl Dahlen, I better be careful with Carl, we have two Carls, but Carl Dahlen is going to uh, tell us some more about that. Okay, go to our heavier weight, okay, we've got calves, and so we see what they're doing, and approximate price there, so we go to our background of calves coming out, and whenever that might be, January, <laughs> February, March. So this is the same slide with our 750 to 8 weight calves in North Dakota, and um, the other thing on this slide the square boxes is, is the futures market because the futures market corresponds with our 750 weight steers. And so, again, you see prices substantially higher than last year and those other years on this chart, and I'll show you the same one in a minute. But uh, a couple interesting things here. One is the seasonal pattern for these heavier weight yearlings tends to be lower in February and March when they're all coming to market. And so the lightweight calves are low in October and November. When they're all coming to market, then when they're 750 in February or March, whatever, they're lower. And then when I show you the fed cattle, you'll see that they're usually low, lowest in July when all that big supply hits. But last year, kind of interesting, if you look at that green line in the middle, uh, was last year after October 15th, we calf prices, uh, 750 weight cattle prices started going up. And instead of going down and being low in January and February, they actually went up and contra seasonally. Okay? So from a backgrounding standpoint, last year was good because our prices, instead of going down, went up. And the futures market this year is telling us the same thing is going to happen. In fact, uh, those, uh, those red boxes there are the today's futures for uh, the rest of this year, up around 141, 142. And then when we get to the January and the March futures, you see them up about 145. And so 145 for 750s, and we're selling 139 uh, 550s now would mean that we, you know, that uh, would be an ideal situation <laughs> price-wise for backgrounding because we'd even be getting more for the weight that we that we bought or that we kept from calves. So it was that way last year. I've got another ch chart also that kind of shows that. So that's positive. Why? Is the futures market looking at higher prices into spring? Well, several reasons. One that I just talked about, and that is that we're going to have fewer. We aren't going to have any coming off of winter wheat, and a lot of them are already in the feedlot, so they won't be in the market, and the feedlots will be needing cattle, and our total supplies are lower anyway. So there are things that point, and again, a lot of things can affect the market. Corn just going down $2 has played into this. If corn would turn around and go back up $2, that would... Uh, certainly hurt us. Okay, this is the same chart and that I showed you before. Again, back similar to 2005 prices. This is the summary market report, and last week not enough of Napoleon to report the market, so USDA just reported the Kist and Stockmans. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want you to just to uh, kind of remember two prices. That is the 550. If I can get this. Cursor, this 550 price of 138.63, that was the average price for 550 to six weight steers in North Dakota. But again, well, in those two markets, we only sold 31 of them. So there aren't any calves really coming to market yet, but 138.63. And then I want you to jump down to the 750 and remember this price, the 135.94. We did sell more of those, were the, were the 750 weight steers. Okay, not a lot of difference there in price, and more on that later, but again, that 
uh, also all funnels in into background. So remember those two. The other thing that I want you to look at is the range in prices. When we look at those 750 to 8 weights there, a $10 range in price for the same weight and grade of cattle at the same markets, okay? Why such a wide range? Or go up to the, those 500s up there. A $19, come on, cursor. There, 139 to 158. They all weigh 500 to 538 pounds. They're all within of a market 50 miles of each other, but a $20 range in price. Why is that? Carl Dolan is going to tell us why that is and why how we get on the top of that range rather than the bottom. $20 or even $10 a lot, and I expect it to even get wider here than that in a couple of weeks when we have weaned calves versus unweaned calves and all those nice things that Carl is going to talk about. Okay, so again, uh, these are just the two lines off the previous chart showing you the 550 this year and the, and the 750 this year and see how those lines are coming together. And again, the closer they come together, the more the market is telling us we want you to background, we want heavier cattle, we're rewarding that, which is just another signal, uh, you know, why we might consider backgrounding. This is the CME feeder cattle index. Again, the same story here, and I, you know, I'm maybe uh, just kind of beating this to death. But this is the feeder cattle index, and this is all 650 to 850 weight steers sold in the U.S. Where we have a USDA market reporter, including North Dakota, and then add in the South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma, all the other markets. The nice thing about this is that these. CME feeder cattle index prices coincide with our prices here uh, just exactly. Remember that I told you to keep track of that, that price for 750s, uh, which last week in the average in North Dakota was 135.94. This last cattle settlement price, and these are daily by the way, but the cash settlement price on Friday, U.S. cash settlement price was 135.89, so you can't get any closer to that than North Dakota. It's just exactly so. We could say even though this is a U.S., this is North Dakota. This is what the futures market is closed out on if you don't get out of a contract. So this futures market and the CME cash settlement index come together. The September futures, when it closed, came together, and it was exactly what the North Dakota average price was. But anyway. You go back there in history and go go uh, up from months starting in uh, with nine, which is September. Go up from September, and we always see the high for the year. My cursor uh, it has a lag in here, so all all those peaks that you see back there are all September first. Come down and you see nine one nine one oh six oh seven oh eight, and the lows are always right around March first. Go up from three one down in the bottom. So we were going down about 20% every year until 2009-10, we only went down 10%, and then in fact we turned around in January and went up. And then of course last year you see what I was talking about from September, although we did start in the direction that we usually do on September 1st there and went down six, seven dollars, the market turned around and by March 1st had went up 17%. So. From where we are right now, they're at 136. If we would go up to the 145, which is what March futures were, were at today, that would be from current prices up about 10%. So, you know, again, kind of a very contra-seasonal pattern to what we're used to, but very beneficial for background. And uh, this kind of tells you the same story that I've been talking about all the time, and we always hear there are all these investment funds in the futures market now, and they cause all this volatility, and they're bad. So my kind of take-home message here, are investment funds bad in the futures market? Yeah, they cause, they cause the market to be volatile. And so the top chart is December corn futures, the entire life of the December corn futures. The bottom chart is January feeder cattle, the entire uh, high, low, and close every day. These are daily charts. And so, are investment funds bad? Well, for the corn producer on the top, if it's, there are a lot of other things besides investment funds, but if we want to blame it all on them, they took corn up to 780. So all the corn producers in southwest North Dakota on September 1st could say, okay, Sell my corn for 780. 
And uh, cattle feeders are saying, hey, that's pretty high for corn, so what are you doing for me? So we come down to the bottom chart, and they're saying, well, we're letting you buy feeder cattle in January when they're going to be very, very short, 750 cattle for 134. But you backgrounder said, wait a minute here. You got 780 corn, and I can only get 134 for my January, February calves. That does not work, does it? I can't background cattle for that. And the answer to that is no. When we budgeted cattle back on September 1st, we had to use something besides corn. We had to use hay and byproducts or sprouted wheat or, or peas. And that's what Carl Hoppe is going to tell us about all these other feeds. But the fund said, wait a minute, backgrounders, just wait a minute. We'll take care of you too. So they brought corn down $2 and brought feeder cattle up $12 and all of a sudden made backgrounding with corn even possible. But my take-home message here is corn went down $2 in the last month and feeder cattle went up $12. Are they going to stay at that level all the way through the next few months? And the answer is quite likely not. We're going to have volatility. Corn going down $2 already went back up a little bit. And what it's going to do, I don't know. It depends on a lot, a lot of different things in the corn market. The corn isn't in the bin yet. And so a lot of things can happen there. And so, you know, some pre-pricing, and we'll just mention that in a minute, might be something to look at. So, not going to spend much time on fed cattle here because, again, we're just talking about backgrounding, but, again, we have record prices for fed cattle. In fact, every line on this chart has been a record for fed cattle, unlike feeder cattle, because corn has went up. The only year not a record on here is that bottom green line in 2009. Otherwise, every other one has been a record high. It's a record high this year. We're going to, the futures market tells us we're going to have an, another record high next year because futures are all above this year. But, again, you see those futures next year at higher levels than this year, we have to have that in order to get the feeder cattle prices that we have because the other part of the equation be on corn price, besides corn prices are fed cattle prices. If someone would happen to fed cattle and they'd be off $10 or whatever, that would certainly affect those spring feeder cattle futures as well. And um, we're not doing the long term here, but I just did throw this in to wrap up. We're expecting prices for cattle to ratchet up the next several years because, again, we're, we are not going to see any herd rebuilding for a, a couple of years, and lower ca cattle and, and, and lower supplies are going to be positive. So, again, take home message tonight things are going to be very, very volatile. If you're backgrounding or whatever you're doing, you might look at some price risk management tools. I don't have time to talk about all of these. I just highlighted LRP, Livestock Risk Protection. Um, livestock Risk Protection isn't available tonight because it's a holiday and the last one that was available was Friday night to, to buy into Saturday. There will be another one tomorrow after 4 o'clock. But we could do uh, a 144 feeder cattle into January yesterday for uh, under $4 premium. So, uh, you know, and then, of course, you've seen the futures market and we have options and all these other things that, that uh, maybe would fit into your marketing plan. But again, you have to know what they are. So to wrap up, again, I'm leading now in. I've mentioned Carl Dolan and I mentioned Carl Hoppe, and now I'm leading into John Duvetter is going to do some budgeting and maybe looking at some alternative feeds to budgeting and so on. I do have a budget on my website, an Excel spreadsheet that you can use, and this is just the one that I have on my spreadsheet, and um, you can change any one of these prices that you want to and, uh, and, and play around with it for your own. But anyway, the one I did, I just, again, started with a 550 up to 750, a, a, a pretty good gain there, 277, feeding on the bottom, about a 72% corn ration that, again, on September 1st showed us uh, uh, a negative profit, but uh, I used 550 corn because uh, the ethanol plant in uh, Washburn is about 550. I looked at Sun Prairie and mine, and I don't know if mine it's on here or not, but if mine you're on Sun Prairie today is at 540. So uh, I used 550 for corn and then some hay and uh, 135 calves in and 139 out, which again is just right what the market is today. That's saying the market doesn't change. 139 calves in, 135 out, 
shows a $77 profit. If you put $145 up there for calves out, which is where the futures are, anybody good at math know how much that changes at $77? It about doubles it up to $150 if you can put them in at $139 and have $550 corn and so on and take them out at $145. So I think there's potential in backgrounding, even using corn. And the rest of the time here, we're going to talk about how do we get on top of the market and what are some of the other feeds that we can use and get them and what are their cost relationship and so on. So I'm going to quit there. And uh, first of all, I guess I'll just see if there's a question in Fargo, then we'll go to Carrington, then we'll go to if mine it's on, and then we'll go to Williston. So any questions in Fargo? Okay, I see none. Carrington, any questions? No burning questions out here in Carrington, Tim. Okay, Minot. Is Minot on, Carl? Yeah, Minot did get oh. hooked up, Tim. Okay, We're hi. here. Okay, hi, John. Any questions? In There's Minot? a question, Tim, from okay. Minot. Shoot. Just a comment, uh, Chuck Fleming here from the Department of Agriculture. I believe that our office is going to pick up, pick up that funding for those other two markets. Great, I great. I don't know if that's official yet or not. Okay, yeah, I know there was talk, and so, okay, that would be good. Thanks, Chuck. Awesome. Any other questions? Awesome. Those markets, now we're down to just reporting Kiss and Stockman and Napoleon, they're going to try to pick up what the North Dakota Ag Department is going to talk about picking up the other two. Any other questions, Mina? Williston, Warren. Yeah. Tim, uh, what about world beef supplies and uh, the uh, possible competition or imports? Okay, uh, our imports are down 20-some uh, percent this year because our dollar is low and there are other economies doing better than we are, so the Australians and New Zealand are sending beef to Russia and other places, so our imports are down. Uh, Calves, I know there's some concern up in Williston and Minot about calves coming in from Canada, but our feeder cattle coming in from Canada are down half this year over last year, and they were down last year. They have a lot of feed up in Canada, and feed barley is what they use up there, and feed barley relative to corn is, we can't really get any in North Dakota, but it's a lot cheaper in Canada, and so I fully expect them their calves to stay up there. In fact, last year, one of the reasons why calf prices went up like they did after uh, October 15th is because Canada came down here and bought calves. And I haven't seen any of that, and we're not selling any again, and whether that happens or not, but that could even happen again this year. So uh, I don't see, we'll see b below what we looked at in terms of average from competition and from foreign competition. For, for beef coming in here or cattle. And it's the other way. We are exporting record amounts of beef to other countries. 2011, again, I said the one word I'm going to say a lot is record. We're going to export a record amount of beef in quantity and in value way, way uh, far a record. Any other questions in Willis? I think any we're all, we're all right any so far. Okay, anything. Okay. Carl Hoppy, I'll turn it back to you. Well, I wish you really could, Tim. All of a sudden, my computer died. Ever have that problem? <laughs> yes. And it's completely blank right now, so I got to figure out how to how to make this thing work. Unfortunately, it might take a few minutes. I don't know. Ah, this is. Uh, um, let's see, do we have his talk? Uh oh, <laughs> we have a screen. Hang on. Do you have any more questions for uh, Tim? Tim, I got a question for you. Yes. There's a drought going on in Texas, and of course there's a lot of cows being killed down south, and inventory of cow numbers, slaughter numbers are up quite a bit. Um, if that ever turns around, and they stop slaughtering cows, what's going to happen to our ground beef market? Are coal cows going to go back up to 80 cents or 90 cents for a dollar? Yes. The, the short answer is yes. Cows will be very high and 
when they start restocking down there, heifer calves are, may in fact sell for more than steer calves in Texas and Oklahoma because they'll want to be restocking. That will somewhat funnel up here, but the last few years, of course, heifer prices as producers are well aware have really been discounted compared to steers, maybe not as much this year, but we're still seeing those light heifers that are just funneling into the market. Still quite a discount on them, and I think I think John maybe is going to talk about that, but if you're, you know, we did background a lot of heifers in North Dakota last year and saved a lot, and again, we had 12% more replacement heifers, so I think there's an opportunity there from a backgrounding and raising standpoint as well. But yes, Carl, they they sold all their replacement heifers down there. They've taken the cow herd down. We're expecting a record liquidation of cows in Texas and Oklahoma. Never in a year before, since we've kept records, have they probably sold that many cows. So. What kind of numbers are you talking about discount-wise heifers to steers uh, at uh, weaning compared to feeder? Or what frame well, right now we get down to those four or five hundred pounds. We're seeing like maybe a fifteen dollar discount, but by the time we even get them up to seven fifty, there's only maybe like a four to five discount. And in fact, <coughs> slaughter heifers are selling for a little more than steers now. Not much, but you know that spread goes from wide up to a little bit positive. So I get there not as efficient and you know don't yield as well and there are issues there but still I think that if it rains no not if it when it rains in Texas and Oklahoma there is going to be a, a really good demand for heifers and cows when it rains and it did rain there yesterday not not enough to solve the drought but maybe that's the start of things but can those pastures come back by next spring yeah, I'm not a range management, but no, they're, you know, they're going to be hurting, and yeah, it's going to take a while to get their pastures back and stock. But Mother Nature has a, you know, can heal in, in, a, in a hurry sometimes, and we've seen that in western North Dakota, but no, yeah, they're, they're and, uh, and they're going to need, this did not, the drought is not broken down there, but it did rain, and it hasn't rained for a year, so that's good news for them that at least it can rain. The other interesting thing to point out is that the, the Stockman's Convention, a couple of weeks ago we had a climatologist that was in and talked about kind of the long-term forecast. And his model said that that drought is not a single year event. They, they said that they expect that drought to go out probably three years. Um, it's a climatologist up from UND. Yeah, the pattern that set up last year that caused them to have their drought is, looks like it's setting up again. So that's that's their concern. Expanding at all or kind of in the same area? He just said similar. <laughs>